In today's video, I'm going to be talking about atrial fibrillation or AFib. AFib is an arrhythmia or an abnormal rhythm of the heart. In atrial fibrillation, the atria, the top chamber of the heart, beats so rapidly, often greater than 300 to 350 beats per minute, that it actually causes the top chamber of the heart, the atria, to fibrillate. It can't actually beat in a coordinated manner, and it beats so rapidly that it fibrillates. Hence the name. The issue with atrial fibrillation is that when the atria is fibrillating, it causes blood stasis in the atria. It causes blood not to be able to move very well. If I were to take blood and just put it in my hand, it would coagulate. It would cause a thrombus or a clot. That same process happens inside the heart in atrial fibrillation. So AFib not only causes an abnormal conduction of the heart, where it's not using the normal intrinsic pathway, where it goes from the top chamber down to the bottom, but it also causes people's hearts to be prone to going in a very fast heart rate. So many of our therapies are aimed at controlling that ventricular rate or how many impulses make it from the top chamber of the heart to the bottom, as well as decreasing the risk of having strokes by using anticoagulation or blood thinners. We classify the types of atrial fibrillation based on how long a patient's been in it. Paroxysmal AFib often occurs when a patient is in it for less than seven days and often spontaneously convert out of it. Persistent atrial fibrillation is when it lasts greater than seven days. And permanent AFib is simply when as a clinician with the patient, we decide that we're no longer gonna pursue strategies to get them out of atrial fibrillation. Nothing really changes, it's just that in permanent AFib, we've decided that the benefit of pursuing therapies to get you out of AFib are not worth the risk. So when I meet a patient in the inpatient, inside the hospital or in the outpatient clinic setting, there are a lot of things that I look at in a routine manner in every patient who has atrial fibrillation. The first thing I tell patients is that it's not their fault. You can be the most in shape person in the world and do everything right and still develop AFib. The human body is just not designed perfectly and as you age, the chance of you developing AFib increases. People in general who are otherwise healthy have about a 20% chance of developing AFib over their lifetime. However, those with modifiable risk factors, things like high blood pressure, if you smoke cigarettes or other nicotine containing products, being overweight, particularly if you're obese, if you have untreated obstructive sleep apnea or poorly controlled diabetes. Alcohol consumption is an interesting one. There was a recent study that found that patients who decreased the amount of alcohol they consumed had a proportional decrease in the number of episodes of AFib that they experienced. This doesn't mean that if you stop alcohol, your AFib is gonna be cured. It simply means that if you drink several alcoholic beverages every day, you are more likely to have episodes of AFib versus someone who does not. Alcohol can be directly cardiotoxic and there's a proportional increase over your lifetime with the amount of alcohol that you drink and your risk of developing AFib. Obstructive sleep apnea is a condition where in the middle of the night while you're sleeping, you stop breathing. Now the body's normal mechanism of paralyzing you in your sleep is so you don't act out your dreams. However, as we age, as some people develop more weight around their neck, the muscles in our neck can weaken over time and it can cause us to be prone to stopping breathing because our muscles literally collapse on ourselves. When you stop breathing in the middle of the night, it causes the heart to go, what's going on? I'm not getting any oxygen. Start beating a little bit faster. It's like getting a workout in your sleep, but without any of the benefit. In fact, it weakens the heart over time. And we know that patients who have obstructive sleep apnea, in particular, ones who are untreated, have a much higher risk of developing atrial fibrillation or having poorly controlled atrial fibrillation. Those things can increase your chance of developing atrial fibrillation. So that's why those are some of the things that I'll address with patients who have new onset atrial fibrillation. I always tell my patients that if it was as easy as a doctor coming into the room saying, hey, you gotta eat healthy, exercise, stop smoking, control all of your comorbidities, that I'd be happily out of a job. I know it's not that easy to do all of those things, but a lot of the mainstays of therapy of cardiovascular health is controlling other comorbidities that in the long term can negatively impact your heart health and increase your risk of heart attack, stroke, and death. So what medications do we use to treat atrial fibrillation? As I said, one of the mainstays of therapy is anticoagulation. The reason for that is that clotting is prone to occurring within the left atrial appendage. That's a location within the heart that causes 95% of strokes that we see in atrial fibrillation. Drugs like Eliquis, Xarelto, Pradaxa, and Coumadin are blood thinners that help prevent clots from forming inside of the heart and preventing strokes from occurring. The flip side of that same treatment is a risk of bleeding. So we always have to look at our patient's risk of bleeding and weighing that with the benefit. We often use a risk calculator called CHADS2VASC score, which helps us determine 
what their risk of stroke is. There are a lot of nuances with atrial fibrillation that you have to talk to your doctor about. And there's a reason cardiology fellowship is an additional three years after a three year internal medicine residency after four years of med school. And that's because there are a lot of questions that we don't know the exact answer for, like how much AFib is considered enough to warrant anticoagulation. In order to better evaluate if you're having AFib, we can use different types of monitors like Holters, implantable loop recorders to determine the burden of AFib or how many heartbeats that you have in the day are normal ones versus how many are in the setting of atrial fibrillation. The second type of medical therapy that we use are rate control medications. These are medications that blunt that propensity of the heart to go very rapid in AFib. One of the classes is beta blockers, things like metoprolol, carvedilol, bisoprolol. These medications, again, help blunt that very fast heart rate that may occur in AFib. If you're sitting in AFib at 140 beats per minute and then you walk up a flight of stairs, you're already going at a very fast heart rate and your heart might not be able to keep up. The second class of medications that we often use are calcium channel blockers. These are like diltiazem and verapamil. Digoxin is another medication that works via the sodium potassium ATPase, decreasing the heart rate at the AV node and also decreases heart rate by stimulation of the parasympathetic nervous system at the vagus nerve level. This medication is much older and it's been around for a while and it is not a first line therapy anymore, but often we'll use this medication in the inpatient setting when patients are very sick and we need another medication to blunt that heart rate, but not affect their blood pressure whatsoever. Now the third type of medication that we often use in cardiology are antiarrhythmic medications. There are a whole lot of them. They have a lot of silly names, but when you're able to understand the mechanisms, when you can use certain ones, they can be a very valuable tool in the armamentarium of cardiologists. One of the most commonly used antiarrhythmic medications is a sodium channel blocker called amiodarone. Amiodarone has been around for a while and it is highly effective at controlling atrial fibrillation, increasing the chance of chemically converting from AFib to sinus rhythm. And if a patient undergoes an electrical cardioversion where we shock them out of AFib, being on amiodarone increases the chance that that procedure is successful. However, the reason we don't just throw this drug at everyone is that it can literally affect every single organ in your body except the kidneys. Because of this propensity to have a wide range of adverse effects, we don't like to use it in younger patients for a long period of time. Inside the hospital, we'll often use this as an acute antiarrhythmic when we can't use other medications like beta blockers or calcium channel blockers to blunt that response and keep patients' atrial fibrillation under control or potentially convert them out of it. You have to remember in the outpatient setting, if your patient's on amiodarone, that you have to check regular TSH levels to check their thyroid function, pulmonary function tests to assess for pulmonary fibrosis, as well as LFTs or liver function tests to assess its effect on the liver. Amiodarone is also used widely because you can use it in patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction or cardiomyopathy, as well as those with coronary artery disease. Another interesting antiarrhythmic is another sodium channel blocker called dronetarone. Sounds very similar to amiodarone, and that's because it is. However, it lacks an iodine group, which causes it to have far fewer side effects. However, much like how it has fewer side effects, it is also much less effective in treating atrial fibrillation or atrial flutter. Another common antiarrhythmic that we use is flecainide. Flecainide can also be used as a pill in pocket to convert patients out of AFib or as a maintenance drug along with a beta blocker. These drugs were studied back in the day in the CAST trial to decrease abnormal heart rhythms after a heart attack. Unfortunately, those trials actually showed a propensity to increase mortality after a heart attack and thus these have to be avoided in patients with coronary artery disease, as well as those with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Flecainide has an interesting chemical property. Flecainide exhibits use dependence. That means that at a higher heart rate, it becomes more effective. That's why it can be so useful as a pill in pocket. However, it also has an interesting side effect where patients who are in atrial fibrillation take flecainide. It can cause a conversion from AFib into atrial flutter in a one-to-one -one conduction. For residents and medical trainees, it's an interesting side effect that you should be aware of in case you ever encounter a patient taking that medication. My last point with flecainide is that it can actually widen the QRS. So sometimes we'll put a patient on a treadmill while they're on their flecainide and increase their heart rate because of its use dependent nature. And when it becomes more effective while they're on the treadmill at a higher heart rate, we can sometimes see that QRS widening. If we see that, we'll often decrease the dose. Similarly, because of all of those side effects, I always give this medication with a beta blocker 
at the same time. The last two antiarrhythmics that I'm gonna mention are dofetilide and sotalol. These medications, conversely, have a reverse use dependence. That means that they are more effective at slower heart rates. These drugs are cleared renally, so they have to be adjusted dose-wise in patients with CKD. The interesting thing about dofetilide and sotalol is that they are both QT prolonging agents. That means that these patients are at an increased risk of VTVF due to torsades. Thus, these patients have to be initiated inside the hospital to monitor for QT prolongation. When someone is started on dofetilide or sotalol to convert them out of AFib into sinus rhythm, we administer five doses within the hospital to evaluate the QT interval and make sure that it's not prolonging inappropriately. The two things we look for is a QT interval increase in duration by 15% from the baseline or an absolute increase above 500 milliseconds. And if their QT interval increases by greater than 15% or goes above 500 milliseconds, we have to decrease that dose or potentially discontinue it altogether. Now I've mentioned converting patients out of atrial fibrillation into sinus rhythm. One of the other tools that we have is a direct current cardioversion. That's where, if you've ever seen on TV where patients get shocked, that is what we're doing, except we are doing a synchronized cardioversion. That means that we're trying to blast the heart with electricity in order to try and shock it back into a normal rhythm. What I always explain to patients is that when we cardiovert them, we are not curing them of AFib. Some patients will never go back into AFib. I've seen patients who are a young 25 year old who drank way too much Red Bull and popped into AFib. They were in it for a very short period of time. We shocked them out of AFib and they're doing great. Other patients who have been in AFib for a long time, we try to cardiovert them out and sometimes they never go back into AFib. Other times they go right back in as they're walking out of the hospital. The thing with AFib is that the longer you're in it, the harder it is to get you out. When you're in AFib, the atrium or top chamber of the heart start to enlarge, stretch out. And when that happens, the microelectrical circuitry of the heart gets a little wonky for lack of a better word, and it makes it harder and harder to get out of AFib. Now, when you perform a cardioversion, it causes electrical mechanical dissociation. In English, that means that for the next 30 days after someone is cardioverted, they are at a slightly higher risk of, if there's a clot in the heart, having it shot out and causing a stroke. That's why if anyone is ever cardioverted who has AFib, it is mandatory that they have to be on anticoagulation for at least 30 days. Often the reason that we will cardiovert someone is that they've only been in it for a short period of time. We wanna to try to get them out of it. Or potentially if they're in AFib and they have a very weak heart, perhaps they have cardiomyopathy or heart failure with reduced EF. If you have an ejection fraction of say 40%, when 15% of your left atrial filling is caused by that coordinated beating of the atrium, losing it can set you backwards. So sometimes patients simply hemodynamically cannot tolerate AFib and by cardioverting them out, it can make them feel a whole lot better and do a whole lot better clinically. Now, often prior to performing a direct current cardioversion, we'll often perform a transesophageal echo or a TEE. That's where, much like when you have an ultrasound across the chest or a transthoracic echo, we take a probe, goes down the esophagus. Now, because the only structure anterior to or in front of the esophagus is the heart, we're able to see the heart in much higher clarity. It's kind of like going from an old tube TV to a new HD TV. And specifically with regards to atrial fibrillation, when we do a transthoracic echo, we're not able to see the left atrial appendage. You just can't. So when we do the transesophageal echo, we can look at that area and assess, is there a clot in the heart? Again, 95% of clots in atrial fibrillation occur in the left atrial appendage. That's why we often have to do a transesophageal echo if a patient hasn't been compliant with anticoagulation, if we're unsure if they've been on it, or if they've just straight up never been on it. That's why we often perform a TEE before a cardioversion to make sure there isn't a thrombus within the left atrial appendage. If there is a clot in there, we do not do a cardioversion. We anticoagulate the patient and often bring them back in 30 to 40 days and reassess, but we have to always make sure that they've been very compliant and haven't missed even a single dose. One other procedure I'll mention is called an AFib ablation. This is where we go in through the groin and literally ablate with a catheter and burn tissue to isolate the various foci of electrical conduction that cause atrial fibrillation. The most common area that causes this is the pulmonary vein. When we perform an ablation, we're not stopping the atria from firing rapidly or having these various foci from firing. Instead, what we're trying to do is isolate them. So it'll continue to fire, but by burning these tracks within the heart, those electrical rhythms won't be able to escape and get to the bottom of the heart. However, they're not always successful. And again, the longer you've been in AFib, the harder it is to get you out of it or keep you out of it. 
And often, historically, the patients that undergo an ablation are those who have been in AFib for a long time and all else has failed. There is some recent literature that perhaps this should be an upfront therapy, but it is not a procedure without risk. So it'll be interesting to see where the research leads us in the next few decades. Another area of study is called a Watchman procedure. This is a procedure where interventionalists or electrophysiologists take a device, put it across into the left atrial appendage, and hopefully clog it up so there's no more flow going in or out of that area. And similarly, if there are any clots that do form in there, they won't be able to get out. This is used in the hope of getting patients off of anticoagulation long-term in case they have a very high bleeding risk. However, this procedure has a lot of upfront risks and it is not always successful. Patients who undergo a Watchman procedure need to be selected carefully and it is not a procedure that everyone should undergo. This is another area of study that I think in the next decade or so, we'll learn more and more information about. But it's another valuable tool that we do have to use. The last thing I'll mention, is some long-term complications of AFib. Another possible complication of atrial fibrillation is sick sinus syndrome. Now, normally the issue with atrial fibrillation is that the heart rate goes too fast. In sick sinus syndrome or tachybrady syndrome, patients can have long pauses or very slow heart rates that impede our ability to use most of our medications to help treat AFib. In these patients, we often have to place a pacemaker. This also allows us to use rate control medications with a safe backup pacemaker in place. Of note, patients without AFib can also have sick sinus syndrome. If you have a AFib or atrial flutter and it's uncontrolled for a long period of time, it can cause a tachycardia mediated cardiomyopathy. Fancy words for if the heart rate goes real fast for a long period of time, it can actually weaken the heart and cause heart failure. Another complication is that it can dilate the atria and not just cause those atria to get bigger, but also cause the annulus of the right ventricle or mitral valve or tricuspid valve to dilate and cause a very regurgitant flow. In these instances, often cardiac surgery is needed to repair that valve. Without surgery, it will lead to heart failure and death. One of the other procedures we can also perform is called an AV nodal ablation. If a patient is refractory to every type of medication and nothing's working, and they are still symptomatic in their AFib, what we can do is ablate the AV node so no more electrical messages can get from the top chamber to the bottom chamber of the heart. Now in these scenarios, the patients are still in AFib. They're still gonna need to be on anticoagulation, but all of those random foci of electrical stimulus are not gonna be able to get to the bottom chamber of the heart. Similarly, however, there aren't gonna be any electrical foci getting to the bottom chamber of the heart. So we have to do an AV nodal ablation with a pacemaker because they'll now be pacemaker dependent. Sometimes this can increase the patient's quality of life tremendously, but clearly it's kind of an extreme measure. It is reserved for patients who have tried everything else. Hopefully this video was educational. If you're a patient and you have any questions, you can comment below. I can't comment specifically about your case, but I can answer general questions about atrial fibrillation. And hopefully if you're a resident, medical student, medical trainee, pre-med, someone just interested in cardiovascular disease, hopefully you found this interesting. If you did, like, comment, and share so other people can find this video as well. And if there's something else in the realm of cardiology or cardiovascular disease that you wanna learn about, whether it's a disease process, medication, or a procedure, comment down below and maybe I'll try and make a video about it.